All right, I'm going to get started. Um, so my name is Jeff Reback. I'm uh, one of the core developers um, for Pandas. I've been doing this for a couple of years, actually. Um, and uh, using my old joke, uh, so Wes gets all the uh, kudos and I get the hate mail. So that's how it is. So anyways, uh, if you've come in late, this uh, if you want to follow along, the, there's a link there to the actual um, repo. You can clone that for the uh, presentation. OK, here we go. All right, this is going to be um, a little bit more of an intermediate uh, level tutorial. Um, there are, and, and I will show you on here. So here's a couple of links I've also put up. This Parts of this tutorial were taken from uh, Tom Oxberger's uh, PyData Seattle t tutorial, which is a little bit more on the uh, beginner side. So um, if you're just um, starting out with pandas, then um, feel free to take a look at that. And there's also a video online. Um, I've also included some links throughout this presentation to, most of it's to the documentation actually, there's a few external links um, to get more information. Um, Pandas is a fairly large library actually, um, and there's a lot of topics, so I'm going to attempt to give you a brief tour of Pandas um, and parts that you may or may not have seen before. Um, I'm going to in particular focus a little bit on performance. Um, I have another talk that I've done. Um, that goes in depth on performance, but I will hit um, some of the main points um, in here. Okay. So uh, if you are following along, uh, installation, um, this is actually using uh, 3.4. You can use whatever, it'll work on 2.7 as well. Um, a bunch of libraries that um, I'm going to mention at least. Um, and then you can, there's a whole requirements file in the uh, notebook itself. Sorry. Bigger? Sure. Better? Yeah, I'll do a little bit bigger. Half the problem is, so the problem is uh, making everything fit on the screen is actually, <laughs> takes a lot of time. But I will try, I'll blow it up as, as needed. How's that? Okay. Let's see, I gotta go back down. Okay. All right, so this talk's gonna consist of essentially six notebooks. I'm gonna talk about um, getting your data in and out of pandas. Um, then looking at your data, uh, we'll go through group by, um, essentially reshaping type operations. Um, we're going to hit time series, and then we're going to talk about um, using pandas in concert with some other libraries that are built upon it, or use it, anyways. Okay, next notebook. All right, importing data. So you have nice data, and okay, as a Almost all my slides have as the top just a couple of standard imports, NumPy and Pandas. I usually set the, uh, some of the display options simply to, to, sh to make sure things show up on the screen. Um, we are using Pandas 17, um, released about a month ago. Okay. So you have data in a lot of different formats. Pandas currently imports and exports from all of these different uh, formats. Um, we're actually probably going to add a couple of more um, things more in the big data stack like Avro. Soon, we'll, we'll see. Um, and I'm going to at least briefly mention uh, most of these. Okay. So um, part of the sample data set I'm going to use is no longer available. <laughs> but um, I have a, um, a gzip version on here in CSV format. Um, if you're interested in the parsing of this data set, it was kind of gnarly, actually. Um, Tom did it. Um, and you can look at his uh, talk. I don't know why they removed data sets. It's kind of strange. but. It's about, it's about beer reviews, so. Okay, so CSV, everybody has CSV data. They want to read it in, they want to parse it, they want to do it fast. So here's a link to how to do that. So standard CSV, um, you read your file, um, we automatically can infer certain types of uh, compression. There's explicit options for this. In fact, there's about 50 options that you can pass to read CSV. It, it's not nearly as complicated as it looks. Most of the time it just simply works. Um, standard things you might need to do, uh, specify a column to set as the in index. You can certainly do this afterwards, but it's sometimes convenient to make it in a single statement. Um, date parsing. You need to be explicit about this. Um, pandas can guess at times. Um, we're trying to remove the notion of just guessing everything, but it'll make some pretty good guesses. Uh, in this case, this is actually uh, an encoded data set, which makes things a little bit uh, annoying. Okay. So um, this just we're just reading it in. Um, notice we I generally show the display 
This shows the a summary of how many rows and columns we have. I've scaled this just so we show it on the display correctly. Okay. So this is what we're going to use for a lot of the um, presentation. Okay. So the first thing um, it's useful to look at are, is an info, which is a basic a summary display showing um, each of the columns, how many non-nulls you have, and what data types they have. We're going to pay particular attention to these data types um, as we go throughout the presentation. Um, if you take, I'll give a couple of nuggets, but if you take the first one is that you really, really want to pay attention to your data types. Um, object data it holds certain data types. In other words, you want to hold, in, for object data type, only strings. If you're holding other stuff, it will work, but it will be pretty much non-performant. If you have float data, you want to make sure it's floats. Don't, make, you know, don't have it as objects. So you really want to be careful about your data types. Strings, I see this all the time. You want to make sure they're really in the base type that pandas and NumPy like, which is daytime uh, 64 nanoseconds. Okay, so we'll talk about this more in depth as we go. Um, this is an encoded data set. Certainly uh, possible to deal with things, um, and we will. Okay, so I'm going to go through a couple of mini examples where we're just simply going to write them out to sort of temporary files, and the, all of the data types or all of the import formats that we talk about. Um, provide both an importer and an exporter. Generally, it's to underscore the format or read underscore the format. Um, okay. So, Excel provides uh, importers and exporters. And you'll notice that most of the signatures of these functions are very similar. Generally, they take a file object or a file like object. Um, and then, a, generally, a bunch of parameters. And for the most part, they're pretty similar, like whether to write the index or not, whether to encode things or not. Um, of course, like in Excel's case, as an example, you can choose to read a single sheet in. So some, some of these formats have special um, parameters. Okay, so we, we looked, so going back, we looked at um, CSV, or we, we just did an example on CSV, um, and I'm going to show these all at the end when I time them. Um, Excel. So SQL is a funny animal. Um, you need to actually give it, uh, in this case, we use SQL Alchemy. You need to give it um, an engine, but otherwise it's very similar uh, in its basic form anyways to importing or export from anything else. JSON, same idea. Again, for the most part, the default options might work for you. There's a lot of options on, on how to handle um, automatic conversions of formats, um, how to actually um, write the JSON. In, uh, in other words, whether write record first or row first or whatever. Um, one of my favorite formats actually is HDF. Uh, so this is HDF5. Um, it's a scientific format that was originally uh, propagated by the astronomy guys. Um, and it's great because it's binary. Um, it's it's a fairly a standard format. Um, of course, there's, there's a lot of metadata uh, um, associated with your actual data files. And this is both good and bad. Good in that you can provide a a pretty much a seamless transition to and from HDF. In other words, it has pretty good fidelity. Um, it's bad because if something else is trying to read your data and doesn't understand the metadata, that's a problem. Um, example, I've seen many people, oh, I really want to use H5Py with um, pandas. And the answer is right now you can't. Um, we use uh, Py tables underneath it to write this format. You can actually read it, um, but you can't actually write in H5Py and then read it back in pandas. This might change in the future, actually. Um, as uh, H5Py and Py tables are undergoing some, essentially a merger. So that's good. So uh, the first thing you try to do is write it in uh, H5Py, or sorry, in um, uh, HDF5. And the first thing that comes up is a warning. <laughs> and you're like, oh, this is not fun. So I'm, uh, just note I'm actually writing in the fixed format here. Um, this essentially writes a single block of data. Um, and it doesn't allow appending nor querying. I normally write in the table format, and I'll explain why I'm not doing that in, in a second. But pay attention to warnings. We don't give them too often in pandas. Um, in this case, it's basically saying, well, we're going to look at these three columns that it's telling you about, and says, oh, these actually have nulls in them. And so um, this doesn't like it. Fixed format is basically it pickles your string data, which actually is it's OK. It's fine. It works. Um, however, there's NANs in there, um, and pickle uh, PyTables basically doesn't like this because it essentially becomes a mixed data type in the single column. Okay, so there's a number of ways around this. You could fill it if you wanted to. Um, for now, we're just going to ignore it. 
and it'll work actually. Um, okay, so here we go. Okay, now the reason I'm not writing this in table form, and I prefer table form, and this is a um, effectively an on disk representation of a data frame, which is um, pre pretty good actually, um, in the sense that we can have um, uh, round trip ability. The only difference here is that you're storing it as fixed length strings. So everything has to become the length of the maximum. This is fine for a lot of data. In this particular data set, so this is why I'm just taking the text column, um, and we're basically finding a vector, a, a series of the lengths of each um, field, the, the lengths of the text for that particular entry. And I'll go into this a little bit more. But my point is that, so we have 50,000 entries, and we have a maximum entry of 4,900 characters. So the problem is we have wildly varying length strings. So in fact, if you tried to write this as a fixed length string, this would be a problem. It, 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 it'll work, actually, but it makes a gigantic file. Um, compression can actually help with that. Um, but in this case, we're not going to do this. And there's a lot of solutions to this, but we're not going to deal with it at this point in time. So some timings for various methods. This is 50,000 records, I think by 13 columns, something like that. So Excel is pretty slow. Um, SQL is better. Um, JSON is um, OK. CSV is pretty good. HDF is actually a lot better. Be like, oh, that's great. But there's actually two more formats I really didn't mention. Um, we can, of course, pickle a data frame. And I'll go through a couple of reasons uh, why or why not you want to do this in a second. Um, and then there's a format um, called message pack, which is essentially kind of like BSON. It's a binary JSON almost. Okay? These are actually much faster even, even than HDF. Um, so just you can think about using these. There's a lot of different formats, so you pick what is useful. So I've put a couple of links up here. So one is uh, Matt Rocklin. Um, he's the author of Dask. He did a basic a study of using essentially all of these formats plus more, uh, storing text data and numeric data. And if you're storing text data, the bottom line conclusion is you want to use JSON, mainly because everybody else does it, and it compresses pretty well. If you're storing numerical data, you don't want to use JSON. You want to use uh, essentially a binary format, like an HDF or even a message pack, or something like that. Um, further, I'll mention uh, the, the Odo library. This library actually provides essentially a set of converters um, to and from more or less frames and NumPy arrays, and basically lots of other things, much more so than uh, Pandas does, things like, like um, HDFS and S3, and well, we actually support S3 now, too. OK. Oops. Did I miss? No, I did. OK. So when you have larger data sets, sometimes you'll want to chunk your data. OK, we can do that. Um, you can provide a chunk size, so you essentially get a list of frames. You can do this primarily with CSV, and you can do this with HDF5. And so you, then you can operate these out in a chunked manner. I'll go through some strategies for dealing with out of core data at the very end. Okay. So a lot of questions here. So what formats can we use for various things? How can we query them? Um, what, ha you know, what can we put over the wire? Um, and various things. So one of my big things is you want, you know, once you clean up your data, generally you want to store it in a format that you don't have to clean it up again when you read it back in. And even things like SQL, you generally have to, uh, it's pretty good nowadays, especially when you use like Postgres, you can read it back in and it'll be um, very, uh, it'll be identical to what you, you sent out. You won't have to do any post conversions. When I say post conversions is you want the drivers to handle these things. You want them to um, make you know, proper date times when you're actually reading back in. So for the most part, it's pretty good. So I could have actually put SQL in that category in the first one um, right up here today. Um, but of course, you, when you have larger data sets, you want to query the data. Um, yes, you can query a CSV, but it's non-performant. Um, you can do it. But, um, and then of course, sometimes you want to iterate over bigger data sets. Interoperability is important to um, lots of folks. We, uh, we all have lots of data in CSV format. It's just how it is. Now, you may oftentimes want to take your data and then put it in an intermediate format or something like that. Okay, So you can review these. Okay, Next. Now we're going to talk about examining your data. OK. So again, we're going to have our standard uh, imports at the top of the sheet. And I'm 
so the data that we saved before in the uh, HDF5, I'm reading it back in. And I'm going to do this pretty much at the top of uh, most of the sheets. So again, we're going to see that we have all the data types already specified. In other words, we have our, this time field uh, is a daytime 64. Um, we have various float and ints and so on and so forth. And I'll go through a couple of these in a second. All right, so Pandas provides a lot of ways of working with particular D types. Okay? So text data is stored as object. Okay? Now, the reason this is sort of useful is because you can do things, you know, Hold on, I didn't read it in. Just a second. I thought I did that. Okay. Here. Okay. Okay, there we go. All right. Okay. So we provide these things called accessors which allow you to have D-type specific data um, via the accessor, so you know the methods that will work on that type of data. If you have float data, you're not going to get this. This is not going to work. So in this case, we have object type data. And then so I can operate and get various functions on here. So we used actually this length function before. This simply counts the number of characters in that entry. And there's a ton more. So a big thing in Pandas is to do operations and then return um, what we call an indexer. In other words, essentially a series that is like indexed to your data. Um, in this case, I'm going to say, OK, take this, um, take this field and say, OK, does it match this regex? And if true, put true. If false, put false. And we can use that for selections later on. So a lot of the interactions in your data will be constructing indexers. And we provide, so. Next, so we just talked about text very briefly. We're going to talk about the DT accessor. So this is how to operate on date time like data. This actually works for um, period, in, period data, time delta data, and daytime data. Okay. So this is our original column. It's in daytime 64. And even though this says time here, that's just the name of the column, we're using this dot DT accessor, and we're actually accessing the date here. And of course, we have a bunch of fields. These are, of course, specific to uh, date time accessing themselves. If we had actually a time delta column, they would be specific to that. So in this case, we're actually pulling out the date object. And these actually are date objects. So you would normally not even do this. This is not a recommended thing to do. Um, but maybe you want to export it or just look at it. Or if you want to group by this, it's actually pretty efficient. But a lot of people tend to work in. They say, oh, I have just dates. But you all, always, always, always want to work in daytime 64s. Okay? You might want to convert it or do some operation on it, but you never, ever, ever want to iterate on things like this. Um, okay. So Why not? There's a lot of conversion So essentially, the, the, my second nugget of wisdom here is that you, if you ever find yourself iterating over something, the answer is A, vectorize, or B, do something else. because. Um, Iteration is just like Python iteration. You, can, you need to do it sometimes, of course. But um, in general, the reason Pandas has um, is, is highly performant is because we can keep things in NumPy arrays. And we can operate them on, on them using ufuncs and in highly efficient methods. So the point here is a daytime date, date object is actually not a first class object in Pandas. It never has been. I don't think it ever will because um, it's basically a Python object. So every time you have to do anything, you have to do a lot of indirection to get to it. Um, it will work. Uh, it's not efficient. OK, going back to um, the access So the reason you want to do this is maybe I want to pull out the hours, hypothetically here. Whoops, sorry. OK. Um, I'll show you a use case for this later. Um, we want to do things like, so one thing you might want to do is do something like this. I want to, again, construct an indexer. I want to construct a Boolean array. That's actually the, the, the crux of Pandas. When I want to select data, I just want to Con construct various indexers and then combine them together. Okay, so here we go. Another type of a data type um, is categoricals. These are relatively new in pandas. Um, categoricals, you could think of as, as really like text data, but they fit in various categories. Um, so you can actually think of categories in the statistical sense, where you have, say, like male or female, have you have two categories. 
Um, so we use them for that. We export them to things like Patsy um, in that way. However, a big use case of categoricals actually is to represent um, a relatively small number of values in a very efficient way. Okay? So if you have, you know, it doesn't matter how many values you have, if you only have 10 categories, we can represent it very efficiently, but essentially by mapping them to integers. And this is all happens under the hood. So taking all of our um, text columns, so this is another method um, relatively new called select dtypes. You can basically take your frame and say, hey, give me only certain data types here. Uh, they have an include and an exclude um, field. So example, we were looking at text where it has 50,000 entries and there's 4, 49,000 you know, odd uniques. Well, that's not very useful. But if you look at the beer style um, field, you only have 104 uniques. Well, that's great because I can represent it very efficiently and that's what we're gonna do. Next step here. So uh, one point to note, there's this memory usage thing when you look at a, a data frame and it has a little plus on it. And that is to tell you that, hey, you're storing object data and you may be actually having a much bigger um, memory footprint than you actually think you do. Um, in fact, storing a single object um, generally takes like something like 40 bytes. It's like crazy um, for each character in there, for, for each element. So the problem is, this is just how um, it works. You know, you think you have a NumPy array, an object array, and you just have a single pointer, and that's what the, the value we're showing here. This is 50,000 times like eight bits or whatever, or eight bytes. Um, but it's really not that, because that object actually has to be stored somewhere in the Python system, and that's just not, it's just not um, the actual length of the string. It's really a lot of information which en enables Python to garbage collect it. So storing um, objects can be quite inefficient. So to combat this, we oftentimes will turn things into categoricals. Um, this is an actual real estimate, or real number, I'll say, of how much memory this is actually consuming. Um, and the reason for this uh, is what I said before. We are basically factorizing things. And if, if you guys were in Andy Miller's um, uh, talk earlier, in effect, this is the same thing that they do. We, we call this factorization. They call this, uh, I think they call it count factorization, something like that. It's the same idea. Um, and what we're doing is we're essentially mapping integers to things, strings, okay? So we have categories and we have codes. This is all in, uh, essentially an implementation detail. You don't have to really understand this. Just know that it's pretty efficient. Okay. Um, I'll skip that for now, okay. So I'm gonna, yes? Yes, HDF5 stores this efficiently. Essentially, we're storing the uh, integers in the table, and then we're storing a side table which has the categories um, mapped back to them. Unfortunately, example, like you can't do this in CSV. CSV is, you just store the strings. I mean, you could do it if you wanted to, but then you're responsible for the bookkeeping. And that, that's really crux of the problem. It's, you can do any, I mean, you can do anything, but if you want to make it easy for yourself, for your users, then um, you have to do the extra work. So the po one of the po points of Pandas is to make it easy and natural for you to do things um, and hide the details. You have a nice language feature, essentially, and you just, it just works. That's at least one of the ideas. It's not always like that, but we try. All right, I'm gonna go briefly through indexing. Okay, so I mentioned before we're trying to construct Boolean indexers, or indexers. Um, oftentimes they're just Boolean values, in other words, you have a series, and you have you know, true, false for each one. Great. Simple, we did this in a variety of ways before. This is the, um, I think this is the uh, average percentage of uh, alcohol in the beer. Alcohol by volume. Alcohol by volume, yeah, okay. So here, what we're doing is we're saying, okay, let me select all the beers that have a relatively low alcohol by volume, okay? So I'm just simply indexing, okay? Now, what we were doing now, this is called, so when you do the single brackets called get item, um, this can take a Boolean indexer like this, okay? However, I'm gonna really recommend that you use um, dot lock for pretty much everything. Um, the main reason is you can then specify, it doesn't have to guess at what you're really trying to do, you can be very explicit. You could say, okay, I'm going to index the rows here, right here, and I'm gonna select the columns, and I want these two columns here. 
You could put a different indexer for the columns if you wanted to, but I'm just telling them I want these. Get item is very convenient. Um, there are some, we'll say, quirks in it um, to make it sort of more interactive. Namely, you can do things like we actually select columns using get items. So you'll be like, oh, I'm selecting rows or am I selecting columns? And so it does some inference. It figures this out. But if you want to be very explicit, use .lock. OK. Oops. So here. OK. So again, we can string these ex expressions together. This is very much like um, a SQL query. And we'll show you that in a little bit. OK. Um, these use a NumPy-like syntax of you know, ands and ors. And you have to use parentheses to group. Unless you have a single one, then you don't. Okay. So yes. So when you're looking at a frame, you you have an index. Um, all frames and series have an index. Um, if you don't provide one explicitly or overwrite it, it'll be what's called an integer index, simply enumerating your columns, or enumerating your rows. Okay. Um, You can have duplicate data, and we'll talk about that a little bit on how to deal with that. Um, in this case, it's a unique index, OK? Um, and there are various um, methods for uh, cr dealing with that. And there's sometimes you want that, and sometimes you don't, OK? Do you have multiple data or not? OK, so in general, in this case, so this, th this is, of course, a pain point in pandas right now. Um, so what is a data frame? A data frame is essentially a collection of NumPy arrays. Um, the implementation right now, and they could be possibly different D types. In general, you want different D types simply because you want to hold heterogeneous data. NumPy array, in general, except if you use rec arrays, is a homogeneous D type. So think of a data frame as effectively, not exactly, but effectively a dict of individual. Each column is a, like a series like object, it's a single uh, NumPy array. It's not actually implemented like that. And I think we're going to change this at some point in the future, hopefully, to be, uh, we'll say, more transparent. So going back to your question, um, these are almost always views, but not always. And that's the rub. And it's, we're just somewhat dependent upon what NumPy tells us to do. So what we're going to do is give you a view of each column. And this is totally highly performant. It's great, except when you try to assign to, to this. And you've probably all seen this setting with copy warning I put in a couple of versions ago. Um, and we'll just briefly mention that. Um, essentially, once you filter something, so if you have a view of something else, and then you try to assign to this, well, what do you want it to do? Do you want me to propagate that or not? And the default behavior is just to give you a warning, because I oftentimes don't know what to do. Um, so we'll, have to, we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. So, yes? A little, a little history. It used, I, I thought the pandas used to be NumPy array. And then you guys changed it. No, it's always been that way. It's always, it's always been, been that way. Yes, yes. He, here's the answer. It used to um, work, but sometimes it just wouldn't work. That was the difference. That's why we put the warning in there, because you could actually end up with a copy, and you were end up assigning to a copy. And then that was like, oh, where do my, you know, I, I assigned something that just didn't change. So now at least I'll give you a warning, and you have to deal with it. OK. So again, um, the bottom line is you want to create indexers, so we're going to use this other function called isIn. This does just what it thinks, it, what you think it would do, except here we're trying to take a categorical column and say, oh, we're trying actually to do a string-like method on a categorical column. So this is an open issue, of course. Um, so this should work. Actually, it doesn't. So we say, OK, what can we do? We have these great categorical columns. What can we do? All right. So one way of dealing with this is to convert it back to a, an object column. OK, it works. OK. Is there a better way? So with categoricals, so now I just want to mention, I'm going to be using this type of style. And I've recently adopted this. Um, it's called method chaining. Um, and essentially, and you put these little uh, the parentheses around it. And you can essentially almost do arbitrary white space around your method calls. The reason I like this is because you can do stuff like this. So it's very easy to do things like edit this and say, oh, go. Whoops. No, it's supposed to work. I probably didn't execute something here. Let's see. Did I even read this thing? Ah, uh, I know why. I, I didn't convert this here. Hold on one second.
is why you should never do live presentations. There we go. Okay. This new this notebook thing is this is called Rise, by the way. It's so it's a live presentation of the slideshow. It's actually pretty cool. You can edit it. Um, and of course, it helps you. It makes you edit it. So, so uh, he, here, what we're doing is we're saying, okay, tell me, you know, take this, take this uh, column, which is a categorical column, and say, okay, tell me the. I'm, now I'm indexing the categories of the column itself, and says, okay, tell me which one, the, which ones I want. So I want to select this list right here, or I want to select this. I'm returning the ones that I want to get. Okay, great, and I assign that to the variable cats. Then here, I can just simply use isn. Isn takes a essentially a set operation says, okay, tell me what's in this, and then creates an indexer for you, and then I can just simply index it. Okay. All right. So we can do this with any number of things. So value counts is a very convenient method to essentially count the values, and uh, it ranks them by the most prop, uh, popular to the least popular, essentially a frequency um, analysis here. Okay. So now I'm going to do something like, okay, I have these beer IDs, and you see that the top three here are these guys. And here I'm going to take the top three, just because I decided to. Now the key thing is I'm looking, I'm saying, okay, take the top three and I'm, give me their index, okay? Oops, let me go back here. So these are the top three, but actually what I want is the index of these, okay? And then I'm going to use this isn't on that to select essentially the top three most popular ones out of this whole um, frame. Okay. I'm just going to briefly tour the sort of the methods of indexing. There's a lot of documentation on this, so I'll just briefly mention some of these just so you can know them. So uh, there's head and tail show me the top five, bottom five. You notice I've not been really using this because by default I'm going to show you essentially the head and tail more or less according to the max uh, rows that I've shown. But you can still do this. Um, iLock. iLock is the positional indexing equivalent of lock, except it completely treats everything as a positional indexer entirely. It ignores all the complications of, well, maybe I actually have an index, which is, say, 2468. Okay? And so the problem it occurs is, like, if I give you 1, 2, 3, what does that mean? Do I want NANs? Do I want you to select the first, second, and third elements? So to avoid this complication, we have essentially two methods of indexing. iLock is for integer, call it integer location indexing, and lock, which is for label-based indexing. Okay? These work on the index. In this case, I said I want the tooth, second, fifth, and tenth element. They happen to be, so the index happens to, to match that in this case. I could change that. In, but. So I'm also doing things. You can, of course, put slices in there, saying, give me the same element, but just give me the, the column slices. Oops. Here. OK. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preempt one of the questions I'm going to ask is there's this other indexer called .ix. This is a combination of integer and location indexing. And the reason we've not deprecated this is actually still useful. Sometimes you want to say, OK, Give me the first 10 rows, and, but then I want to name these columns. It's kind of convenient. Um, we don't highly recommend it because there are some edge cases. Um, and the main one is that if you have an integer index that is not simply you know, the enumeration of the rows, you can get unexpected results. So you can certainly use it, and it has its use cases. Okay. So location indexing, this will give you it's now here, it's not looking at the second, fifth, and tenth row. I know it says that, but it's actually looking at this as a label, not a position. That's all you need to understand. It's a label. Everything's a label. Okay? And here I'm doing some combination of label-based indexing, and you can always pass a Boolean indexers to these. Okay? So this was the question I said. Why do we use IX? Because sometimes you want to do some combination of integer-based and label-based indexing. Okay. Now, there's something very important in that this index that we're dealing with is unique. Okay? The reason it, uniqueness is important is we can do hash table based lookups when you do indexing. It's very fast. That's great. But sometimes if I'm, so I'm setting index, it's not unique. So, okay. It'll still work, actually. 
but it's a fair bit slower. Um, it's a little bit less intuitive of what you're doing. So in these cases, we're going to go to hierarchical indexing, namely multi-indexes. Don't be afraid of multi-indexes. They're very friendly. Um, and they're very powerful. So you can do things like, so here I wanted, what I want to do is set, the, uh, a new, set these three columns as my index. And we have a sparsified view of this. So in other words, um, this is the, these are called levels. So this is the, it's actually called the zeroth level, the first level, the second level. These can have names. They have names. They happen to be the names of the columns. Okay. And one thing to note about um, multi-indexing is you, they always must be lexically sorted. They don't actually have to be. It'll still work. Um, in general, you almost always want to do that to make it um, perform. Otherwise, we'll throw a performance warning, actually. Long, complicated reason why for this. OK. So why is this useful? Because now we just set this index right here, this thing called reviews, and now it's unique. It was not unique before. So now we can do very efficient lookups. OK. We're going to use this in a second. Um, so here I'm again. I'm going to show you here. I'm going to do something live. Oh, wait. Yeah, I think I can do this. Yeah. So here I'm saying, give me all the values in the index itself for this level. Give me all the values. So 50,000 length, one for each one. Value count them. And then give me the top five. We'll call those our top five reviewers. We did this a little bit before. And so now I'm using lock and I'm saying, OK, this is actually incorrect syntax here, but let's see. It'll act, this will actually work. Hold on. Let me just show you why this is wrong. Uh, hold on. What am I doing here? Here is that. This. No. OK. No. OK. I said it was right. There's some ambiguity of what I'm actually doing here. Okay, um, so here I'm saying essentially I'm indexing by those um, top reviewers that I did. Okay, so just and that selected this many. Okay, now I'm going to. So now I'm going to pick out a particular value. I'm giving it a tuple. So multi-indexes are represented by tuples, and you can fully index by them if you specify. You can specify actually a list of tuples. In this case, I'm only specifying one. Now where this gets this useful. OK, is where I want us to do multi-axis indexing. So we have this notion of a thing called a, an index slice. It's just, it's a really simple object to avoid having to type these little slice objects. The whole point of this is to enable, so remember lock has, you can index on the rows and the columns, potentially simultaneously. Um, so here, I have an additional complication, because now my index is composed of three sort of levels. So I'm using ix to differentiate of what I'm doing here. So this is a fully specified indexer on level 0. And I'm actually level, also on level 1 here. Okay? And I'm also simultaneously selecting only a certain number of columns. Okay? Um, something we introduced not so recently um, is called query. This is actually a very convenient method. Unfortunately, you have to, it has to be a string. Um, but we do allow things like you can use this little at sign to inject actually variables into the scope. Kind of a little sort of hacky trick there. But um, the advantage is you can almost write a SQL-like syntax, which some people may, may find useful. OK. Sorry. No. OK. Uh, OK. So the reason this is useful is be, you couldn't do this before we had what we call multi-index slicers. So here I'm selecting only on the second level. Um, I'll just put one caution up there. You have to fully specify all of the levels, even if it's by a colon. In other words, you have, otherwise, it becomes a little bit ambiguous of what you're trying to do. You can actually leave off the last ones, but you've got to put the first ones there. Um, in the future, I think I have a slide for this. No, I don't. We're going to allow this to be um, a select like a dict like syntax, which should be a little bit nicer in this case. OK, next section. I'm going to talk about group buys. All right. Let's skip that. OK. Using the same. Uh, data set that we had, group by. What is a group by? A group by is fundamentally three different operations. Um, splitting, applying a function, and then recombining the results. Okay. 
So uh, you can group by many things. Um, usually you want to group by like, a, you can group by a column, you can group by the levels of a multi-index, but you can also give things like, you could actually give a function, you could give a dictionary or a series like object that has a mapping. It could be a completely arbitrary mapping, it could be anything. Um, this is where things can get quite interesting. So. Uh, group by just creates an object. It doesn't actually do any computation. It just gives you an object back, and we'll, I'll show you how um, that's useful in, in a little bit. Okay. Um, there's a lot of operations you can actually do on a grouper itself. You can say, oh, how many groups do I have? Um, you can actually iterate through groups. I don't normally recommend this, but in this case, I'm just showing you um, the first five. Group by is always done in the ordering of the, um, of the original order of the frame. Okay, we're not like resorting anything. It's simply an indexer effectively into the frame itself. Um, I'm just printing this columns thing just to reorder the columns in a bit, so ignore that. Okay, so what are we actually doing here? I said, okay, give me this group and then show me the columns in order. And the reason, oops, here. This is exactly like this. It's just simply a selection, that's all it is. Everything you notice is in the same order. Of course, this is very inefficient comparatively because we're, we're essentially you have to go through everything to find the result. So by grouping, we've essentially pre-computed um, this set. Okay. So once you've grouped, then we have, we can perform a, effectively a combined step here, an apply and combine. So we're going to execute a function. We're going to do something on each group. This can be either a reduction or it could be a transformation. I'll show that in a little bit. Okay. So in this case, what do we do? We said, okay, we're taking the mean of every group. The, um, what, the thing that we were grouping by ends up as your index here. And I'm going to show you a couple of different um, ways you can utilize this. It's very flexible. You can apply your own functions here. Um, I'll just caution that uh, when you're applying your own functions, in effect, what you're doing is a loop over the groups. If you have a small number of groups, great, no big, no big deal. If you have a large number of groups, this can be highly inefficient, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. So we can do things like um, select a, so actually on the group by object itself, we're doing a subselection. I don't want to do the mean of, say I have you know, 100 columns, I only want to do the mean of these ones. Okay, we can do that. We can do just a single column, and this uh, will return a series. This is effectively like just give me one column, but in this case, in order to get um, this, you can get this back as a frame too. I don't know if I have this hooked up here. You could do this. Yeah, so this gives you a frame. Again, it's the same uh, notion of lookup in a, a data frame versus a series. Okay. So. The reason this is useful is, again, we have these chain type operations. So what we're going to do here, oops. So again, I'm going to group by beer style, give me the um, average by volume, alcohol by volume, and give me the standard deviation. Again, it's in the, it's in the order. It happened to be alphabetic order, but that's the order it was. And then let me sort it. OK? Yes. Uh, the answer is yes, and I'll show you that in a second, actually. Um, the other thing to do here is, of course, you could do this. We could do, you know, you could pass a function here. Yeah, yeah. This is actually a function. Instead of standard deviation, I'm going to do, like, you know, uh, this, is, this is, you know, kind of silly. But um, this can be anything. But, w again, I'll caution that all of the functions that are sort of have na are na already named, these are highly efficient. They're all implemented in Cython. Um, there are... So this is not going to be quite as efficient because what we're doing is we're calling it on each, we're essentially doing a loop. So, but if you don't have a lot of groups, it's probably fine. Um, and there's various ways to, to deal with this, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Okay. So just as we did a single aggregation, now we're going to do a multiple aggregations here. You can just put a list of functions. You can give um, a, lot, a lot of cases where you can give a name. You can also give a NumPy function. You can actually give lambdas in here as well. You can do, uh, notice that this just gave back a simple frame, and we'll look in a second here. So, oh, I think we did this already. Okay, skip that. So we can also do multiple aggregations. This gives back a, um, a multi-index 
Okay, so here we've said for each column that we're looking at, give me back the mean count and standard deviation. Okay, and we're, go we're going to reshape this in a second. All right, but you have a hierarchical index. Uh, some people don't like working with them directly, and some, you know, sometimes you want to reshape it. Okay, so let's talk about doing that. So this is the result from before. Remember, we group by to get this, and we have a two-level index. I, I just named them characters to measure because I couldn't find some good names for that. So these are two different um, aggregations. These are stacking. So what we're doing, a stacking is very simple. You're taking the columns and you're shifting them to the index. Okay? And I did it two different ways here. I said, okay, I'm going to shift the characteristic to the index. Here I'm going to shift the measure to the index. And whatever's left is left. But you get two different ways of looking at your data. Now, there's also an unstack. Stack and unstack are inverses of each other. So, oops, here. Stack and then unstack. Get back your data. Okay? Going back. So, sometimes it's very convenient to have my um, frame with a multi index. You can also group by uh, multi index. You can either use um, Positional indicators, you could use level zero, or you could use the name. So here, I'm actually going to do, so this is the stacked version that we did before. Then I'm going to group by, um, I'm going to select the, this is a column now, and then I'm going to aggregate. So what do we do here? I mean, this seems oh, it's a crazy thing, but in reality, there's a number of ways to do things, but Again, we're going to set up pipelines to do things. Okay. Um, ah. So, not only can we group by a single thing, we can group by multiple things, and this ne necessarily gives you back um, a multi-index of the result. And think about this. So we we ended up these these are a sparsified group here. Now, here's something that people say, okay, oh, let me group by something, and then let me, in my apply, let me group by something else. So I've seen this written like this. Let me do a, uh, let's see. So this is highly inefficient, and I've seen it a lot. It does the, basically the same thing. Okay, there is no reason to do this ever. Um, it will work. Actually, yeah, you probably have to do some stuff. But in any event, try to keep the stuff inside the apply extremely simple. And I'll go through an example of this in the end. Um, it just makes life simpler, and it's it's more it's easy to read too. Okay, this was an exercise from the original um, tutorial. I'll just sort of give you the answer because we don't have so much time. Um, so just as it, just as we've been grouping by the columns, you can also group by an arbitrary function or anything that has the same length as your um, frame. So in this case, we're going to group by the length of the text, completely arbitrarily here. So we're grouping, I'm passing a function here. I, I, this generates a series, actually, is what it does. But the series doesn't happen to exist in my frame. It's just an arbitrary one I created. Um, we're selecting a single column out. We're doing the mean of that, and we're doing a funky plot of that. So fundamentally, we're, this is the column we're constructing, and then we're grouping by it. This has you know, some arbitrary number of groups. Okay. Um, we're going to go over transform in a second, but to summarize, there's essentially three methods you can apply to a, a grouped object. You can aggregate. You can tra so uh, aggregation is generally a reduction. Transforming is just what it sounds like. You are taking every value in the group and transform it to something else on a per group basis. Apply, you can do sort of what you want and we'll figure out what you want. Okay. Now ag is, there's a lot of shortcuts to ag, things like dot mean. Whenever I do that, I'm doing an aggregation. Okay. So, transform. Okay. So a typical transformation will be something like the meaning per group. Okay, so we can write it like that if we want. And if you actually did this on a series, Okay, 
We're, this is almost trivial, right? All we're doing is taking the series and subtracting the median. That's not what we want. We want to do this on a per group basis. So we could simply transform it with that function. Okay, so per group, we're going to do that. However, it's oftentimes much better to actually, uh, what I call unwrapping the group by. So you could write that exact same operation as a series of just take the data from itself and subtract um, a transformation with the mean of the group, okay? And I, I'm just doing the select D types because um, if you don't do that, you will get this. This actually does take a couple of seconds. So you'll see all these, these, these columns we don't care about. You know, we don't care about um, text columns. But in this case, we're, the group buys will normally exclude these type of text columns. Okay. Now, the reason this matters, um, you can get a fairly substantial performance boost doing this. Um, this is, of course, completely dependent on the number of groups. If you only had um, 100 groups, this would be like you know, 100 times faster. So it's actually a function of the number of groups. Um, so you know. Okay. Next thing we're going to address. Hopefully we don't run out of time here. Okay. Okay. So barring from uh, our friend Hadley Wickham, uh, basically he's the author of dplyr and R. Um, you generally want to have um, set up your data such that it's essentially a long form type of data. You want to have uh, one row per observation and then your variables form a column. You don't want to have these conglomerated columns, names. You can, certainly. And a lot of Panda's power is to transform that stuff to a long form type of data. Um, this is how, you know, generally you might keep it in a database. Or not. Okay. So we're going to use this example here. Uh, I'm not going to execute this, but you can actually pull this. This is using the readHTML returns um, a, a, series, um, a list of tables, actually, to get this is, I think, MBA data from 2015. Here's what it looks like. This um, CSV, I don't know if I have it in the repo or not, but you can just simply download it. It's not that big. So we have, again, a messy CSV. Now, we're going, we're going to read it in in a second. We're going to try to answer this question. How many days of rest did each team get between games? This is a messy thing, okay? Now, it's a lot, it's, it looks a lot messier than it actually is simply because I'm trying to keep the width down here. <laughs> um, but again, I have this, okay? So this is just a simple read CSV, and I just simply, um, I said I only want certain columns, okay? So far, this is pretty raw data. I'm using this fairly new method called assign. And what this does is, is will inline in the method chaining create another column, it copies the data for you. This is exactly equivalent to copying the data, assigning a new column, and then returning it. But we can do it in the method chain. In this case, what am I doing? I'm actually taking the date column. So yes, read CSV could actually parse these dates in line, but I'm just doing this as an example. I'm taking from before. So we had actually dates and times. We're not actually going to use the times, but um, I wanted to put them together just because it looked cool. So here we're actually doing a string concatenation, and then we're parsing it. Oops, right here. OK. And I added this column on called date. And this looks like a date time 64 nanoseconds. It is. going to drop some columns and set the index. OK. So Oftentimes you'll have a scenario where you're reading your data and you're doing a lot of manipulations and then you're, you're done. Great. So put that off in a function, call the function, and move on. Okay. So here's our basic data. Uh, what am I doing here? I'm just assigning some index names. It's not interesting. Okay. So there's two methods I want to introduce you to, or if you've already seen them, you'll, you'll be excited. Uh, melt and um, pivot. Okay. So here we're going to take wide data to long data. So let's go here. I say this is wide data because we're doing things like away team, away points, home team, home points. So you'll notice that these that we have 1,236 rows here, four columns. We're going to do this melt thing, okay? And we're going to basically transform it. We're going to go like this with the data, okay? This actually comes from R. It's a nice little method of doing this. Every, a lot of things come from R. It's not bad. And the, the, now, just to, just to prove what we did here, so this created duplicates, okay? 
and I did it on purpose. I'm not indexing off it yet, but I just did this on purpose. So we effectively took a row and we split it and we added it on to the, to the long set here, okay? And the inverse of this is long to wide. It's essentially a pivot. So a lot of people are familiar with pivots um, where you have a value in a column and you basically, in effect, you group by on that and shift it like this. And we'll show that in one second. So that's kind of the inverse of melt. Good point. All right, so now we have our data in the tidy form. So now we're going to do something. We're going to say, okay, let's group by our team, get the date, diff it, and get the number of days. And I'm going to show. I'm going to unroll this operation in a second. Okay, so this is the result. This is how we did it. So we said, okay, I'm showing this for one team here. I'm grouping by and saying, get to get to the Lakers, and I want to then get the date column and then diff it. So I'm taking I'm doing a shift operation. So, so I'm taking my date column, shifting it up by one, subtracting it. I get a time delta column. And then I happen to be taking the date, the, so the number of days in that, subtracting one. OK, fine. That's days of rest. OK. Now, I oftentimes want to visualize my data. So this is this is relatively new operator called pipe, which is extremely convenient. And this is the reason I'm writing this method chaining type of stuff. Um, I could pretty easily just comment these two lines out and shove them to, you know, to matplotlib or to bokeh or to whatever, and it would be very easy to do. Um, and of course, this is effectively equivalent to something like this. Let's see. Oops, sorry, that's not what I meant to do. So I could have written it, if I put the facet grid stuff outside of here, it, it would have done the same exact thing. But that's a little bit inconvenient, and that's why I'm using this piping. Notice this map, actually, is not a pandas map, actually. This is operating on the result of this. This is a Seaborn function. So what are we plotting here? I'm going to go through that in a second. But we are plotting for each group. We're plotting two things, and we're doing a nice little graph of each one. So this is effectively the same exact thing I was just doing, except I'm doing it for one team, just so we can see this. Um, I don't know an easy way to make that bigger, but I can go like this, this maybe. And just to show you what Seaborn is actually doing, they're actually doing an internal group by, okay? And they're doing this uh, sum divided by count, okay? So these are the values actually they're showing up here, just to show this in a, in a nice visualization. No, pipe actually sends the result of the prior operation to this. We, we're, we're handing um, we're handing Seaborn a data frame, okay, a fully qualified data. It doesn't actually take a group ob by object. It actually does a group by internally is what it's doing actually. But um, just for simplicity, I'm just showing one single group here. Again, we're we're basically sending it long form data. That's what everybody expects. So that's what we want to give them, and let them take it from our pipeline. Um, this is a little bit more involved example with stack. I'm going to skip this actually for now. Just keep in mind, uh, I'm going to show you one thing over here. This, this actually goes through how to do merges or how not to do merges, um, just because I'm going to run out of time if I don't do this. You can do some crazy merges. This is a merge of a merge of a merge. And you can actually pipe to yourself. But and I'm not going to go through this. So if I Python people, this actually becomes trivial. You can use a map function and to avoid merging. So this is actually a really convenient, from a syntactical point of view, makes a lot of sense. So this is what a series map does, actually. It's almost like a, doing a merge on itself. OK. Anyways, this also goes through a more, um, a couple of types of pivoting, um, but, and how pivot does. But I, I, I'm going to have to skip this, so I'm going to run out of time here. OK. So I want to briefly talk about time series. Um, this was, a, was part of the reason Pandas was originally developed to handle time series data. I'm just going to give you a mini tour of this. Uh, Jake Vanderplus just did a recent blog on uh, the Seattle bike share. So I said, OK, I'll take the uh, New York City bike share data. Um, I couldn't find an easy way to W get this, so I just downloaded like one month. Whatever, it was fine. 
it actually, th these bike share data are pretty good because they're, they're generally um, e very easily importable. So our pipeline is really simple in this case. We're just gonna say parse these dates. Um, I added this inferred daytime format. So the reason for this, so you'll notice the dates are like this. This is actually not, it's very close to an ISO looking date, except it has the slashes. So this inferred daytime format will try to guess at your formatting and it'll do things like um, put different separators there. So if it's transformable in a very straightforward way to ISO, then you can um, parse it in a highly efficient manner. Okay, so here's our data, great. Again, uh, first thing I wanna do is look at my D-types. You know, you can tell if you imported the data correctly or not by looking at D-types, very simply. If you have all object, then you did something wrong. If you have what you're expecting, then, then you're happy. Okay, so again, I'm gonna do a simple thing here. Um, let me do this here. Okay, we're gonna talk about resampling. Resampling is just a group by based upon time. It's all it is. It's a, it's a, it's a group by with a time indexer, okay? So here we're gonna start or take our, our set and we're going to set the index to um, the t uh, time field, it's called start time. We're gonna select out the bike ID field. This is actually in some sense arbitrary because I'm, all I'm interested in right now is the counts. I can group by on anything, it doesn't matter. I wanna resample to hourly. So I'm taking my data, I'm chopping it up into hours automatically, um, and then I'm giving a result, okay? In this case, I'm just counting. Counting how, how many non-nuns are in that group. Non-nulls. Okay, nice plot. I could have done this in the, in the pipeline, um, it just doesn't fit on this page if I do it that way. Um, but now I said, okay, I wanna do something a little more sophisticated. Okay, so let's, let's just walk through this example here. Again, I'm going to, the reason I wrote this like this is because I can do just like this. So we start with our original frame. I'm doing something fairly new here actually. Um, I'm using this thing called grouper and this allows me to embed a time grouper inside a group by itself. So I can have one term which is essentially a resampling term, then another term which is not, okay? This was used to not be possible. Um, this is kind of cool because you could say, okay, as I said before, don't try to do group by of group by, and that's what everybody would do. They would do resample, and then inside the resample, they would give a function and do something highly inefficient to do that. So in this case, I'm going to group simultaneously by the uh, daily frequency of start time and by the user type, which I think is um, customer or subscriber. We're going to count them. Oops, sorry. Count them. Okay. Great. I have the count each day for each to use a type. Okay, and then I'm gonna do a series of operations here. So first thing I'm going to need to do, I'm going to reset the index. So basically I'm gonna turn this back into a uh, long form looking type data. This was, a, this was a series before. I'm gonna then pivot. So I'm gonna go group. Okay. Now this operation actually is I'm showing what this actually should be, but uh, reset index doesn't actually support the other axis. So I have to do some transposes here. Okay, that's kind of boring. What did I do? I just renamed some stuff is all I did. Okay. And I get a nice little plot here. This is, um, I think, by day, which users, you know, custom, you know, I think uh, how many people are using it, something like that. Okay. But maybe I wanna do something like I wanna zoom in, okay? So this is effectively like, you know, you have all your nice visualization systems. This is effectively what they're doing. They're doing something like this. They're taking their initial intervals. Pandas actually allows you in a very convenient method. And I say very, it's convenient, but it's sort of unintuitive because what am I doing here? I'm saying take all the dates that match from the start date to the stop date I'm specifying as a string. If I'd specify them as a timestamp, it'll still work and that actually gives you exact intervals. Strings are effectively like, give me all the dates that start with this through the end. It's just, it's called partial string slicing. It's very convenient actually. But here's the, here's the rub. I'm actually doing this, I'm doing a slice on the rows, but I'm doing something which I traditionally would be doing with, uh, normally I would be accessing the columns here. If I, if I give it like a list of variables, those are the columns. So I'm doing something a little bit odd here. Um, but this is, was designed this way. Um, we may eliminate this at some point, even though it is quite convenient. 
really what this should be is dot lock, because then it's really explicit what you're doing. This way we sort of have to guess. The fact that you have a time-based index means we're going to guess right. So if you do dot lock, then the first argument is the rows. The exactly. It's very explicit what you're doing. Here, there's some guessing going on. Now, it's not so out of the realm to guess. However, people do this, OK? And you and they expect it to work. It's not going to work. You, actually, this will work. The reasoning is because here we're giving it a slice. We're not giving it, you know, before. So it's, it's a little bit, this is like a little trip up, which you don't want to have to deal with. It shouldn't work like that. It does. It does. OK. So in any event, essentially what I did here is I resampled this. Um, again, the count, and I zoomed in is what I did. So we did the, the first plot before, but I zoomed in. OK. I have no idea why the 10th to 11th of September of this year was lower. I just, it's like a Thursday. I couldn't figure out any reason, but whatever. OK. So you notice that I use these things. I used H and I used D over there. These are called frequency objects, and Pandas has a whole suite of these. Um, a lot of people like date manipulation. So we provide lots of little things, like so when you can construct a date, by default it's going to be daily. But you can add hour offsets if you want. You could even do things like this is month start. So what I'm doing is I'm constructing a, um, an index here, and then I'm saying, OK, give me the same time, but give me on the first of every month. And there's a, a myriad ways of doing these things um, to construct exactly what you want. Here's a month end. And here, you know, you can construct in string form. You can actually do this programmatically or via strings. Just give me this arbitrary frequency that I want. It's a regular frequency. It doesn't have to, if you use date range, it'll give you a regular frequency. OK, just interruption. Time zones. Time zones have been um, substantially revamped in 17. They're now highly efficient, actually. Um, before, these would be stored as object data, and so they would be highly inefficient. Um, so I created this, effectively it's a D-type is what it is, um, to represent these. And so now, in addition to having daytime 64 nanoseconds, you can actually have a time zone. Okay? And you can, of course, do things with that. And again, we're using the DT accessors. You can convert things. And you can even uh, change them to naive. Uh, time zones are a whole separate ball game, and we, I'll encourage you to read, if, if you need them, uh, read up on them. Uh, the funny, the anecdote from the mailing list is we have, um, there are three fellows who, uh, their sole contribution is to discuss uh, uh, date time, uh, uh, daylight saving times transition issues. And there's got to be like 20 issues on this. I mean, you know, think about it. How do you do like a resample over the time series? Do you include, exclude? Now, all that said, Pandas is quite good at this stuff. I mean, we handle all kinds of, of um, time zone stuff that was just really, really gnarly. It is, it is terrible. Sorry, but go ahead. That yes. DT is not a column in a data frame. No, DT. So I'm, this is a series, and DT is an accessor. Okay, it is a special construct, kind of like str or dot cat, which allows you to access. I don't know if I have this defined here. Let's see. To access various methods. Let's see, can I do that? Eh, it's not defined. OK. Various methods in there. OK. Um, time deltas, let's briefly mention these. These are essentially a subtraction of dates, if you think about it. OK. I'm just going to give you, oops, sorry, hold on. Now, the reason these are useful. Um, you could work with these before. These are a first-class data type as well. And they represent you know, units of time, either positive or negative. Um, a lot of people, like in physical type of experiments, they like to say, OK, I'm starting at time 0, and I'm proceeding forward. There's no date associated with that. You could, um, but it's not relevant for that, for that use case. So time deltas become uh, interesting for that. The reason we're also interested in them is if you have data like that, you can, of course, so you can do arithmetic with them, convert them to seconds, things like that. Um, I'm going to show you. Here's the example. Uh, this is not interesting. Oh, uh, this is a different thing. OK, skip that. OK, so I'm going to show you another example of resampling, uh, going back to what we were talking about before. Pretend you have, um, I think I did 1,000 periods here in um, the first, um, first one second of the market. OK, pretend you're trading and you're doing that. That's like the say all market randomly here. And so you can do things like you can resample, and we'll, we have a lot of predefined functions that are very fast, things like OHLC, so the open, high, low, close. 
and we'll just do this for you. This is like defined in Cython, very easy. You could also put your own function here. So you can, you can give a lambda here. As I said, you, you generally don't want to do this. Um, x, like x, you know, some, whatever you want to do. Um, as this will, again, just be called on each of those groups. But this is um, just another example. I'm, I didn't even cover this, but missing values. So oftentimes what happens is, so you're resampling data, whatever, and you have holes in your data. You have NANs. Pan is actually quite good at handling NANs. And it's, it, it handles NANs in your dates. It handles NANs in your float data. Not integer data right this second. It's going too soon. Um, and you can fill. And there's various methods of filling. You can interpolate. You can do all kinds of things. This, in this particular case, this is just a fill forward. Okay. There's a lot of cool things that are buried in the docs. Um, these are computational tools. So we call these things like doing a rolling mean. So this is effectively, if you think about it, it's a transformation on time, or on a window, actually, rolled. So it's kind of like a moving group by. Um, in fact, I'm going to change the interface for this in 18, so it'll, be, it'll look really much like that, actually. Um, but for now, a lot, lot of goodies in there. OK. Now, my last thing here, so we don't run out of time. OK. So there's a lot of people who use Pandas just you know, to munch data and then do their own analysis on it. Great. However, a lot of people, well, I'll say are downstream of Pandas, um, things like, here, I'll give my nice little, this is my little picture from before. Things like um, uh, scikit-learn or stats models um, or, or DASC, say you're working on some bigger data. Okay? So we have a concert of upstream. Uh, uh, so example DASC, which we'll go through in a second, is both upstream and downstream. So we can use it for compute, or people can use it on a higher level with a pandas-like interface, and it actually uses pandas. Whereas scikit-learn purely takes data frames, but you might, they might be part of the pipeline. In fact, if you were in Andy's talk this morning, this is you know, a huge part of processing, is taking your raw data, doing bunches of transformations, and then bunches of analysis, and keep going, and then eventually you want to output it. So pandas is uh, generally part of this pipeline. So, okay. so we're, I'm just going to briefly show uh, little examples with these, and I'll show you some performance stuff at the end. Okay. Uh, here, let me zoom back in here. Okay. So this is just using scikit-learn. I'm not doing anything uh, sophisticated here at all. I'm simply, I'm going to read some stuff in. And I'm, I'm going to, th this, is, this is the red button. I just hit the button and get some results. And right now, this, this is going to change apparently in a new version of scikit-learn. But right now, this is what I get back. I'm like, oh, this is awful. And I get back this like, you know, list of weird stuff. OK, so this is going to be fixed. This is my little unpacker to get it back to something that I care about. Um, so pandas is useful here. It's not that useful in the sense that I have to you know, do some looping and everything. But it's useful for you know, transforming my, my results of my experiments back to something that I can actually deal with and, and do further st statistics on. Okay. Um, and of course, what would I want to do with that? I'd want to maybe pipe into something else. Or maybe do some transformation or whatever. Or plotting. Um, I can do the same thing with stats models. Stats models uh, is also a great library. Um, here I'm going to read in some data that we did previously. Um, there's a couple of quirks in stats models. Um, it actually is highly, uh, it, it understands pandas a lot, especially in its time series models. Um, but it has little quirks like, you know, when you have true false values, you have to make them integers. OK, that's fine. And we can just shove it again. I'm using the, my same exact syntax. Um, and I'm going to plug it right to there, do some fitting, get a nice summary. Great. Okay. Here's another. I'm using. We're using Patsy uh, internally in this in this um, slide here to um, to actually use our formula interface. So that's pretty cool. And I do the same thing. Okay. Now I'm going to show you. I'm just going to end on. I have a little bit of time here. Um, so. Pandas is very friendly to using Cython. It's also very friendly to using Numba. Uh, it'll be even more friendly in the future, but for right now, I'm going to give you an example of why you would want to even do this. So this is a, a function that does EWMA, so exponential weighted moving average. 
Um, I almost literally copied this from our docs. I, I did cut out some stuff, on, and I'll tell you why in a second. Um, this essentially, uh, you know, in, if you write this in Python, it is pretty slow. Um, but it's readable, but pretty slow. I'm going to write the same exact thing in Cython, um, and it's almost a copy-paste. Yeah, we have a couple of identifiers here. The one thing to note, um, so in Cython, I have to allocate my memory, run my function, and then I'm going to wrap it, okay? I'm going to do the same thing, and I'm, so I'm, we're going to call that Cython number one, and this is Cython number two. It's actually calling the pandas EWA function, just for comparison purposes. It's actually written in Cython as well. Um, here I'm going to call number. Um, number is, I'm, I'm going to do the same thing actually as I did with Cython. You don't actually have to do this in the new version. It will actually allocate the memory and return it to you. But we're just, for comparison purposes, we're going to make it the same. And you have to wrap it in series. Um, in the future, we're going to support um, the ability to pass a, take your series, pass it into a number function, and return it as a series directly. So you wouldn't have to do any of this little, it's a little bit of boilerplate, not bad. But again, you know that the code, I just shoved JIT on it. That's all I did. Um, here's, I just, I'm confirming that all the results are the same. That's important, because otherwise then you're comparing apples and oranges and that's bad. Okay, so Python is pretty slow. I think this is even a small uh, series I'm doing. Um, Cython's, you know, quite a bit faster. Surprisingly, Pandas is slower. That's interesting. And, and number is also quite fast. Um, the reason pandas is slower is because we're not doing null checking in the examples I had. So it takes a little bit of time to do that. Uh, important, but a little bit of time. Uh, so before I get to Dask, I'm, so we're, we're going to have some um, hooks basically in pandas to be able to easily um, shove your stuff right to number. And again, we're going to make it as transparent as possible. It won't be completely transparent because, example, um, unlike, say, like Bottleneck or NumExpress, which we automatically use if they're available, Numba has things like, you may want to know if, like, you're doing something funky in your function and we just cannot compile this, so we go back to no Python mode. And that's what you want. And so the choice is, do I raise and say, okay, hey, this totally blew up, or do I allow you to actually pass the flag to say, okay, hey, I still want to do it. So. It might be a slightly different interface, but we'll get there. Similarly, um, when you want to deal with out-of-core data or when you want to parallelize things, Dask is a, is a great um, solution to this. It has a very nice pandas-like interface. So here I'm actually I'm creating a data frame. I'm doing this method from pandas. I'm using Dask here, and it gives me a Dask data frame. Essentially, Dask is... Um, it has a view, a kind of a view on a data frame, and it chops it up into blocks. And then you can operate on these blocks um, in parallel. Um, you can also do dependency graph stuff. We're not going to get into that. I think Jim Chris has a talk later today on that. So the answer is yes. Okay. Um, so, okay, the question was, does Dask handle data frames that don't fit in them? And the answer is yes. So in effect, what you would do, um, there's a couple of good examples, and I, and I know Jim will point these out later today. Um, you have your data, say, sitting in files, whatever. Um, it, you basically can uh, read it using the Dask routines. Uh, it doesn't actually read the data until you're ready to compute with it. It will read it, it will chunk it, and then it can parallelize this and do, it do all the dependency graph stuff. It's pretty cool, actually. So in Pandas, we're actually thinking about, again, providing an, sort of an easy way to, hey, let's just auto parallelize stuff that we know is going to work. So here's an example of something that we might want to do. Um, so we do a group by, and this is a fairly big frame. By going to Dask, I can get this done in a multi-threaded way. And this is one of the reasons we released the Gil um, in order to enable this. And I get a free sp a speed up for free. I'm not doing anything else. You won't even know. I, it'll just work. And I think that's um, a nice benefit um, that Pandas can provide. Um, I think I have a graph up here. Hold on one second. I think I had one somewhere. No? OK. Well, whatever. Um, OK, I have a few minutes left. Any questions? Anybody? No questions? Everybody knows it all? Go ahead. Ah, okay, so um, I have another talk which I'll, I should post a link to. Um, so here's some things you should really never do. Um, don't use apply. If you can avoid it in any way, shape, or form, don't use apply. It's essentially like a loop. 
Another thing I've seen a lot is if you have a bunch of, say, you're creating a bunch of frames and you need to concat them, don't do it in the loop itself, okay? What you want to do is just simply put them in a list and then concat all at once, okay? Pandas, basically every operation is pure, so it's going to copy stuff and give you back a new copy. Um, so this is a very convenient interface. It's nice. You know there's no side effects. But example, when you do this in a loop and you got, you'll, you'll exponentially copy stuff, bad. Um, what else do people do? Ah, so if you have, if you sometimes you want to get your access to your NumPy arrays. So if you if you have a data frame and you access uh, the series, and then you do dot values on that, you're going to get back a, a, the NumPy array itself, okay, or a view on it actually. Great, perfect. However, generally you want to hold mixed types in your data frames. The second you call dot values on that, I'm going to give you back an object. I'll give you one. I'll give you an umpire array, but it might be upcasted. And say you have strings and floats, this is bad. So I'm going to show you a quick example here. Let's see if I can even do this here. Can everybody see that? Let me zoom in a little bit here. And so if I do df.a, oops, spell it right. Great. This is a NumPy array. Okay. But if I do this, it works, but I get an object array. So immediately you're losing your efficiency. That, so you need to think about these type of things. Anybody else? So the question was, if I have a legacy data format, uh, what are the options to exposing it well to pandas? Um, <laughs> export to CSV. Um, I, you know, th these these are unfortunately they're somewhat specific questions. I mean, the most common things that people keep um, data in, we can read directly. But if it's a legacy data format, um, you need some sort of converter. Um, if you can migrate your data, that's a great thing to do. Um, <laughs> not great solutions. Um, say that again? I mean, you could certainly create some functions to read and write it, I mean, in your own library. In fact, I've seen, um, I think these are the physics, physics guys, they read this format called root or something like that. Um, and, you know, certainly there's a ton of formats out there. Um, we've, you know, we've discussed, because you want to make it in a nice interface, right? So. We've discussed actually having like some people could have a library of those out there, and we could just you, you can just patch them in at runtime if you want. You can make a package which does this, um, just to have a nice interface on it, I guess. In a group by object, what is the data type of the uh, you know collection of data? They are series-like, but they aren't series. Uh, the group by objects don't really have data types. It, what they're doing is they're holding on to. Um, basically two things. One is the original object, and then two is a reference to essentially which, gro which um, rows belong to which groups. So whenever you're doing this selection, what happens is we're saying, okay, you pull up that original data, so it's whatever it was. Okay, so whatever you're actually grouping on, it's just a subset of that. It's the same. Okay. Um, you could actually do things like, so you, you could alternatively convert this to, um, you could do this. You could make a, re uh, you could make a rec array, which is slightly more useful. I mean, this is the, you know, the only problem with this is, um, I mean, you, you notice this is like, in conceptually it's pretty simple, right? It's, it's basically, it has a D type, a composite D type. So this is almost like a data frame, actually, if you think about it. Um, 
I don't see people using these so, so much, but um, you can use them. And actually, uh, when we store things like in pie tables, actually we export to things like this, and then this is how they're actually written. It's a, it's a row-oriented format. So this is really wholly dependent upon NumPy, and unfortunately, that's, views are extremely convenient. Um, there are cases where it'll actually give you a view um, if it can, put it that way. And that's sort of the rub. It's like, I don't necessarily want to have an operation that is dependent upon what actual data I have at the time. You want an operation to be data independent. Um, and that's why this, views are extremely convenient, but um, they violate this principle, <laughs> unfortunately. The user has to know too much. So, so the answer is yes. <laughs> any other questions? All right, so that's it. I'll be around a little bit if you guys have any more questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>